fifth aspect of abstracting I'm calling structurally determined selecting filtering. And we need to say something about that. We say that something is going on, we just take that as given. Good solipsist said, well, you can't prove that. Right, well, we take it as given, something's going on, we interact with it, but we interact in terms of our own structure. This is why our friend from Las Vegas can't see light in the physics sense. You're not built for it, are you? You can't detect. Until today, I was. <laughs> what do you see about Monday? Okay. <laughs> we might even stay over just for that purpose. <laughs> okay. So the abstracting then is not simply a matter of responding to some things and not responding to other, leaving things out. What we're saying is ab initio, from the beginning, we respond to some things and not to others because of the way we're put together. The nervous system has very definite structures, are increasingly being uh, precisely described, and we're saying that what we write from the outset can take in and cannot take in is determined by this structure. Now notice this has nothing to do yet with attitude, this has nothing to do yet with bias, preferences, orientation, worldview, anything of that sort. We're saying to be a nervous system is to be able to respond to some stimuli and not to other. Can we call them other stimuli? If we're not responding to them, are they stimuli? Apparently not. There's a lot of stuff going on. Because of the way we're built, we can respond to some things and not to others. All right? Well, let's take a simple example. Is uh, Radio Moscow available in this room? No? Yeah. Why? You say yes. Okay. The inferred structures called radio waves, we take it, are present. So in that sense, the broadcast is available in this room, isn't it? Why can't you hear it? or you are not an instrument to respond to that kind of mag electromagnetic behavior. You're not built right. But neither do I have to be if I had an instrument that could... The question is, and do you have to be? We're just being descriptive. Okay. Right. You cannot hear Radio Moscow the way you are presently constructed. If you start hearing it, we have a subject for research. Okay. <laughs> a filling that picks it up. As you say, play it again with filling. All right. So let's understand that in a very tough sort of way. We are not at all yet involved in social interactions, preferences, things of that sort. This is transcultural. We claim that this applies to the Zulu just as well as to me. All right. Now, you know, we're not talking about people who hear private broadcasts. You know, I had a, a veteran that I was working with a couple of years back who was getting messages about what he should do from his car radio. He also took PCP. I think that he thought that that would enhance his reception. <laughs> well, it enhanced his reception at the clinic, I'll tell you that. All right. Something going on here, responses here, strictly structurally determined. All right? Now, and that, of course, is a, a base reason why a lot gets so-called left out. Let's not say left out, which is not responded to. Can't. But what gets responded to doesn't get responded to in terms of the structure here. It gets responded to in terms of the structure here. This stuff does the responding. And if you can think of your skin as a kind of a boundary, permeable, obviously, we won't be elementalistic about it, we won't cut ourselves off from the environment, 
but recognize that then, by God, there's some structure here that's different from the structure here. And all the mysticism in the world is going to change that. If you consider this as a kind of a boundary or an envelope which encases you, you say there are some things you respond to, but immediately, as soon as the response, as soon as we're talking about a response, we're talking about a transducing of energy form. And we're using transducing or transforming very much in the sense that the radio engineers use it. We take so-called sound waves and we transduce them into different vibratory patterns such that the ear brain system will be affected and we say, I hear the music or the broadcast, whatever it is. So we change energy forms. While we ourselves do this, this is why in a very deep sense, observed long before McLuhan, all instruments are projections of the human nervous system, extensions of the nervous system. And for by and large unconscious imitations that the nervous systems of the inventors made of their own functioning. So we do it. It's not surprising that we do it. We transduce. We had speed of light, electromagnetic energy out here, electrochemical energy in here. And once that transition occurs, which of course does immediately, we're talking about a different ballgame. Very significantly different. So the simplest seeing experience is already the result of structurally determined and transduced or transducing abstracting. All right? Does that make you feel lonesome? What is it? We have approaching now five billion people on the planet Earth? From Mountcastle's point of view, this may be one of the reasons why so many people feel lonesome anyway. With all the company we have, we still have this feeling of being alone. Well, he says, at peripheral levels, neurologically speaking, there is some relatively shared experience. But as we become more and more concerned with the central nervous system, we are more and more unique. At the Institute seminars, um, the two-week seminars in the summer, uh, we use a film. We've been using it for a few years. And this year, I've seen the film maybe four times, and I heard a statement in the film for the first time. I've been watching it four times. I finally heard a statement. It was produced here in San Diego at the Neurological Institute of some sort here. I forget the name of it. And uh, it's a computer graphics presentation of structures of the human brain. Beautiful thing. As of, just as a work of art, it's fantastic. Uh, and any of you who are in the business ought to see that you get a copy of it and use it. And the statement that struck me this year, which I hadn't heard three times previously, was that for these neurologists making these studies, each brain is as individual as a face. Compelling, isn't it? You look around and see all the faces you see, and even in times when you see somebody who looks so much like somebody else, with a little bit of looking you can see the differences. And these people say that that is characteristic of brains as such, that they are just as distinctive, recognizably so, to those who are doing the work, as faces. So, we shouldn't be too surprised about the differences that we experience among each other. The next phase, integrating. We know that from peripheral levels, the sensory system, which is part of the nervous system, still see today, even in people reporting technically on brain structures, they talk about the senses as opposed to the brain or the senses as opposed to the mind. Hogo washo. All part of one system. However, the system manifests a structure which we can detect and we can talk about initial peripheral receiving or reacting to stimuli which in a sense we can say moves centrally and once becoming a brain experience gets integrated. We don't see 
or hear, experience these electrochemical firings at these levels. What we experience in the simplest perception is a result of this which has already been put together into some kind of whole. This is what we mean by the integrating function. Now up to this point, we're talking about, let's call it pre-conscious functioning, pre-conscious. I want to avoid the word unconscious because of the associations that that has for most people in the world of psychiatry. Pre-conscious, something non-conscious. We call it non-conscious. Consciousness, we could say, enters into the picture here, at least in a beginning sort of way. I'm aware that I have some image. Uh, I'm experiencing an image of some sort. I see an, an image right now of a whole bunch of very different looking nervous systems, okay, organisms. Now, a fellow of A.R. Loria has done work um, on the brain that's starting to have uh, an increased impact on American neurobiology in which he feels he is able to describe the brain as a hierarchical system and allocate these different functions to very definite masses of tissue within the brain. A.R. Luria is his name. D describes brain structure in terms of detectable structures which to which he assigns specific functions. And each one involves very much in reverberating sympathetically with the structural differential uh, description. Each one involves a level which summarizes the previous level, goes to a higher order of abstracting, leaves out, so forth and so on. All right, fine. The next stage, projecting. And again, we have to be aware. Most of us think about projecting in the sense that it's used in psychology, where we assign our own feelings to somebody else, that kind of thing. Uh, I feel hostile, I see hostility in other people. Uh, what we're talking about here is strictly a descriptive neurobiological term, as I want to use it here. Now, it constitutes perhaps the mechanism or the, the substrate for the kind of projecting that the psychologist talks about, but I want us to under, understand it here in strictly a descriptive way. And let's define projecting in this way. And I won't put it on the board, the board's too small. But you can <coughs> write it down. Projecting the tendency of brains to locate their own experiences elsewhere. the tendency of brains to locate their own experiences elsewhere. Now that includes not only my just taking it for granted without even thinking about it, that the image that's in my brain related to y'all is out there. I'll take you to be about six or so feet away, 12 feet away, and so forth and so on. But it also relates to the intra-organismic projecting that we do. That's the, well, that's the old famous pinch your finger thing. Would you do that? Pinch your finger? Krzyzewski always used to ask people to do that. A lot of people didn't want to do it. Pinch it hard. Pinch your finger? Jim? Ah, how subtle of you. That, can you make it hurt well enough that way? <laughs> Not into the sadomasochistic stuff, eh? Okay, fine. Where's the pain? Okay. We can now introduce the anthem for this weekend. The pain and sprain is mainly in the brain. Da -dum -dum -dum. The pain and sprain is mainly in the brain. <laughs> You'll do it better tomorrow, <laughs> after we've had a few rehearsals. Okay. Projecting, intra-organismic projecting. So, technically, we would suggest, or I'm suggesting, that it might be more appropriate, rather than saying, I have a pain in my finger, 
to say, I have a pain in my brain at the finger. I'm experiencing pain, which I allocate to the finger. Does that have survival value? Sure, of course it does. Just like my projecting my experience of water beyond that railing has survival value for me, especially if I can't swim. Fine. But this we can become conscious of, can't we? We could think about this rotating disc and realize, wow, I was interacting with that rotating disc, I experienced whatever I experienced, and I said it's on the disc, projecting. So I can become conscious of that, and then I can think about that and decide are there aspects about that that are negative for me? Which, what kind of projecting is useful? What kind of projecting might be very harmful in my relationships with other people? These, I claim, we cannot become conscious of. I would suppose if we become aware of our immediate transducing of energy forms at the peripheral levels, I would suppose that that would constitute an intensely agonizing form of neurological disease of some sort. But maybe not. There are all kinds of ways of perceiving, and as we are well know in California, there are all kinds of claims made that seem to transcend the limitations that we're discussing here. And we're not going to particularly challenge those. I'm simply saying this is, to my understanding, a Krzyzewskian structure, which is very congruent with current discussions in neurobiology. By the way, I might stress now, it, you know, general semantics is so simple, baby talk and all that, uh, and yet a very uh, a good friend of mine, with whom I've been associated in the field of general semantics for many years, recently sent us a paper, uh, and it really goes back to the 60s. It was published in the General Semantics Bulletin, not really responded to, in which he suggests the formulation semantic construction, as opposed to just semantic reacting, semantic reactions, and so forth. And his claim is that Krzyzewski talked about abstracting solely as a process of leaving out details as you move to higher order abstractions. All right. And I want to emphasize that if a brilliant cat like that could make that mistake, then we might be sure to mold this over and see if we can make sure that we don't make that error. The abstracting includes this transducing, which we could well call semantic construction, if we like, but it's not something that was not accounted for in Kozhevsky's original description. All right, now, here we have a break. The break is not as definite as we might have thought a few years ago before the gorillas and the chimpanzees started being taught language. Particularly interesting description of the learning processes of two gorillas uh, <coughs> Coco, I think, is the older one, female, and Mike, uh, younger male. Uh, Coco is said to have a, a kind of an immediate day-to-day -day vocabulary of something like 375 words, and a more extended vocabulary of terms that are only occasionally used of some 600, approaching 700. Okay. She communicates by using Amerslan sign language, the language of the deaf, for communicating with each other visually. In the United States today, there are about 250,000 humans and two gorillas who communicate with sign language. And very interesting, the behavior of these gorillas, particularly Coco, the old one, indicate very clearly that she's playing tricks that she does things to, to try to fool her the mistress who's, who's been training her. She 
is training the younger gorilla. And the younger gorilla is learning a lot of stuff much faster than she learned originally. Maybe they're starting to time bind. Well, they don't have libraries yet, but watch it. Somebody suggested in one class, boy, what would happen if they would escape and get back into the jungle? <laughs> Frightening. Well, okay, so I just want to suggest that we used to make a very sharp distinction here as we move from general nervous systems, including animals, Fido here, into the human level. Now we're going to have to hedge our bets just a little bit. But still, by and large, we would say, for the majority of the animal world, when we move to this level of talking and various levels of abstracting, we are plunged right into the middle of the human realm. All right, this morning and, and last night, we've generated quite a bit of data experientially. We, we've talked a lot. Well, you've talked and I've talked and you've experienced and you've uh, abstracted and you've found some things and heard some things. And now we're, we're moving to a point now where we're going to summarize. Um, in a Krzyzewskian way, these abstractings that we've been doing. So what I'd like to do now is move on to the structural differential and simply label the, the parts of it and talk about it. But with relation to what we've done so far, I want us all to commit ourselves to not going beyond any point unless we feel satisfied at that particular point. All right, we talked before the lunch hour break about the process of abstracting, and we basically started at this level, where we talked about structurally determined abstracting and transducing and integrating and projecting, and then finally talking about it as human beings. Now we want to go a little beyond that to a strictly inferred structure this level, called both the event or the process level. Now, Krzyzewski, in responding to Einsteinian physics and to various other intellectual currents of the early 20th century, was very much concerned with trying to make a simple visual representation of some of these terrible subtleties that these people were working with. So I want you all to go to a clean page and draw this approximately in this form. And when you're doing it, don't make the mistake I did of turning this parabola into a horseshoe. Make sure you keep this pointing out that way and this side pointing out that way because there are serious methodological implications of that. Now, when you're doing the circle and the, the, you know why these have this shape? Does anyone have any idea? Yeah. You know why that is? Hmm? Yeah. But why this shape? Well, Krzyzewski lived in America in the time when you put a bunch of laundry into a bag and you wrapped around the top of it and you put a tag on it precisely of this shape. It lasted well until the 30s, because I remember it myself. It was a label, a laundry label, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Everybody comes out of a culture. Some people escape a culture, but everybody comes out of one. And Kozetsky is one, too, so that's why these shapes are here. So copy that in an approximate way, but I want to stress that don't count the dots or if you're thinking three-dimensionally holes, you know, just put a few more there than here, more there than here, and it actually should be more there than here, but that doesn't, isn't carried through here. But make that change for yourself. Make fewer dots as you go along, but we'll see that actually these fewer dots cover a lot more territory, but we'll get to that in a moment. When the signal gets to the muscles, there's also a return message to the brain. Mission accomplished. And that makes a difference to the brain. That's why C. Judson Herrick suggested 
that learning to think is very much like weightlifting. If for some reason or other you aren't satisfied with the size of your bicep, you can do this and then put a weight in it, and pretty soon there's a lot more blood goes into those tissues and the damn thing builds up and stays there, so that even when you're relaxed, you have these big bulges in your sweaters and so forth and keen. Well, Herrick suggested that if you want to get to be a better thinker, you do it by exercising the thinking mechanism. And the analogy between that and muscle building is not strained, not a bad analogy. It involves blood flowing into the tissues and so forth. So in encouraging you to take notes, I'm simply trying to apply a little bit of neurobiology. I'm not imposing or being arrogant. I'm simply saying that if you write it down, if you make the drawing, if you look at what you're doing while you're doing it, you're going to retain it a lot longer because there will be changes in brain function. Well, okay, let's proceed. The event level then, strictly inferred. In spite of ion scan microscopes and a lot of very sophisticated microscopy of recent vintage, there's even one kind of microscope, I, I don't know if it's the ion scan microscope or not, which examines a specimen by eliciting electrons from the specimen. That's got to make a difference in the specimen, doesn't it? So even in that most sophisticated observation that we are capable of, we cannot avoid interfering with the target. We make a difference. And that's one of the reasons why even today, 1979, what is that, uh, 54 years after Einstein, 40-some years after Heisenberg, with the uncertainty principle and so forth, we still say that what the parabola represents is strictly inferred. And I hope that we now have a very more immediate feeling for that notion based on our response to the rotating disk this morning and the <coughs> apparently oscillating trapezoid last night. We saw what we saw. There's no question about that. You saw what you saw. The question remains, What's the connection between what you saw and some structure out here? That's at the heart of what we're talking about. Well, Kozhevsky, having read a lot of physics and stuff, decided, well, I'll use, and he was trained mathematically, I'll use this paraboloid shape to indicate an indefinitely extended something. Now, he sometimes uses the term infinite, which can be represented by a mathematical symbol in that way, but it's very important to recognize, and this is important for all of you mystics among us, it's very important to recognize that for Kozhevsky, infinite simply meant indefinitely extended in this case. The limits not known. It did not mean for him unlimited. That's too strong a commitment. How in hell can you know that something is unlimited if you don't know its limits, you know. And you can go goofy with that kind of good stuff. And it's partly at the heart of the history of philosophy. <laughs> you know, it, neither term means a thing to us, does it? If you say the universe is limited, you're compelled to say, well, what limits it? And if you say the universe is unlimited, can you deal with that? Can you really internalize the notion of something without any boundaries at all? Probably strictly verbal problems. Probably speculations that come out of the nature of the language that we have built into us as babies. You and I experience finitude. We experience finiteness. We heard that we were born. We don't remember it. Well, maybe some people who get really well regressed remember it. But by and large, I suppose most of us don't, certainly we don't claim that we remember 
Well, we can't remember, can we? The moment of conjunction, sperm and ovum. One of those rascals wins the race upstream. Millions of them. Very excited, active fellows. Notice how we're anthropomorphizing here, projecting into the sperm. The sperm don't know from nothing, except to do what the salmon does in that special upriver course. And eventually, some sperm meets up with some ovum. But how could you possibly have a memory of that if, as we say today, the organism that eventuated in you only began when that connection was made. So how could you possibly have pre-connection memories? Well, that's an aside. The point I want to make is that all of this stuff, strictly inferred, what we call the, invent, the event or process level. And now, please turn the cassette over for the start of side B. Now the dots that are there are called characteristics. of the event level. But let's put that in single quotes to indicate that's a, a dangerous term, a little bit flaky. Because we must understand that when we talk about the characteristics at this level, we are not talking about things like smell and color and tactile resistance, that kind of sensation. All of the characteristics at this level are strictly presumed inferred. No one can perceive directly at this level. <coughs> but the physicists, particularly, infer that at this level, atoms, electrons, neutrons, protons, and all that sort of thing, that there's something going on and it behaves in certain ways. And of course, we have some good empirical data, which we mentioned earlier today, that we said the Japanese at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, if they had survived, might have made this into their national anthem. They would have recognized a transcultural truism. They would have said, if they could still speak, it doesn't matter if I'm Japanese or Hawaiian, Polynesian or Caucasian or black or whatever, this applies to me across cultures. But the ones who might have said that didn't survive. They had the most intense experience of Einsteinian reality, but they got rearranged in the process. So we can't quiz them. Pity. All right, so when you talk about these characteristics at this level, please understand that this is a very blank, neutral notion of characteristics. It doesn't mean smells, touch, and, and sensations in general. We assume that it, there is a world out there, and at this level, there's a, some kind of structure, and there are certain kinds of characteristics. All right, now, we made the point earlier today that in abstracting, in responding to this event level, which incidentally happens here, we're part of this process, are we not? Important to recognize that. We separate it for purposes of analysis and also to stress that what we happen to experience, we should not confuse with all this stuff that's going on here. There are structural differences that are important to take into consideration. So we separate them. Now here's the notion of what we might call simple-minded abstracting, or abstracting as understood by the simple-minded, if I may seem unkind for a moment. We respond to some inputs, some stimuli from the event level, 
but we don't respond to a lot of others. And as we pointed out this morning, this is pre-attitudinal. We don't respond to many things because we may not. We're not built to be able to do so. Now, within this level, we talked this morning about abstracting as involving structurally determined selecting filtering, and I'll abbreviate that way. We should locate that here on the structural differential. We said that abstracting also involves a transducing process. I do not respond to what's represented by this event level only in terms of the event level. I respond to these events in terms of my own structure. We have here, if we talk about electromagnetic energy, the speed of light, 186,321 miles per second. Here, in the so-called object level, we're talking about responses at a maximum speed of 225 miles per hour. So there's a big difference. Now, in using the term object level for what's represented by this circle, and the circle suggests a closedness, a limited characteristic. When we say the object level, Krasinski did not intend the level at which we perceive objects. What he intended here was the level at which we integrate select, transduce, project what we call objects, the level at which we experience what we call things. Now, this is very important. It seems to me that in a lot of general semantics training, because Krzyzewski himself was a little careless about this, he would sometimes say the object level, but very often would say the objective level. Let me, let me just finish this sentence. And it seems to me that a lot of people who've had general semantics training will have the illusion that if they can get from here to here to the objective level, that they are being more objective or that they are somehow eliminating their own participation in structuring the responses that they have had. And I want to make a very strong case against that. Yes? starting to get a little lost. Can Good. you give me an example of, of what's happening there? Like, you know, like a specific example. What, let's pour something into that. What is an example? Atoms, electrons, molecular changes of all kinds. But which I mean, like, like an example of a thought. In other words, which, this is a definition of... Well, I can't do that at this level. Oh, that's just all intelligence. This is all the stuff that's going on. That's right. That's why we have this parabola, because it suggests an indefinitely extended something. We don't know what the hell it is. As if it might be the brain. The, no, no, the brain doesn't come into play in here, except that the brain posits this, but we'll get back to that later. But we're saying, for starters, we, uh, we make the inference. We assume that there's something going on, a tremendous amount of something, but we don't know what it is. We don't know the characters. Like no, 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 no. Let's, let's not bring that in. Hmm? At the first level. All right. This is built. This is derived from modern physics, which says that at base, all reality that we have any knowledge of at all is a process, is electro, uh, electronic kind of interchanges, atomic behavior, neutrons, protons, all that sort of stuff. Then you're talking about energy. Yeah. We, you know, Heis uh, not Heisenberg, but Heraclitus said, everything is far. How would we say that today? Spirit? Everything is far out. <laughs> 
Well, maybe during the lifetime we had some spirits and we made us far out. I would say it was energy. Yeah, I think that's what Heraclitus had in mind. The physicists might translate Heraclitus' statement, everything is fire, into everything is energy. And this is the basis from which Krzyzewski derived the structural differential. The event level simply asserts, following Whitehead, that everything of which we could have any knowledge at all constitutes some kind of event. Let's pause and think about that. You're leaning on the table. Why don't you go through it? Because it resists that. Why does it do so, as far as you know? Because the motion of the molecules and the cohesion of the molecules of the table prevents the molecules that make up my body from going that way. Splendid. See, he's read Eddington. Or somebody. <laughs> All right. Another way to say what he's saying is that his structure and the structure of the table are such that they resist each other. Eddington used to say that everything that we have any knowledge of constitutes a mad dance of electrons. He would sometimes lean on a table and say this table is mostly empty space. And you say, well, why don't you go through it? It's precisely for the reasons that Bruce just said. Or that is, we infer it's for those reasons. We can't see those reasons, can we? But we infer this is a highly concatenated structure built up on the work of many, many physicists for many, many years who have concluded together as a group that what's represented by the parabola shape here is an indefinitely extended something, a plenum within which we're all embedded, and that the plenum is organized in such a way that it constitutes a process, we could say at certain times made up of very small particles or wave responses, actions and so forth, constantly in motion. For my purposes, if we could get through this and have a fairly sharp understanding of this, then the rest of general semantics almost follows automatically. I'm saying over and over and over again that if some of these things are so, then the other things must follow as the night the day. Indexing, dating, all the extensional devices which people tend to grab as popular general semantics don't mean a damn thing to me unless we understand this stuff. The indexes and dates, the extensional devices are simply a very simple summary of this stuff. So we have to stay at this level so that the indexing and dating doesn't become a power game. You understand that in mathematics the parabola shape is used to, to indicate some kind of indefinitely extended structure of some structure. We don't have to know what the structure is. We're simply asserting that it's indefinitely extended. Infinite in popular terms. Yes? Mm -hmm. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Characteristics which we infer. That's a very neutral. Now, when you say characteristics, would you define, by example, what you mean by characteristics? I mean that we assume that this structure has some structure. We assume that because of its structure, it behaves in certain ways. But it's very important that we do not identify this with what we usually think of characteristics, smell, taste, Smell and taste operate together, sounds, what touch. And, uh, we're, we're way f far away from that yet, although they're all wrapped up in this. But, you know, we haven't gotten there yet. Would you say that that comes along ray, here. One, hmm? one, would you say the cosmic ray sensed and recorded properly and so forth and agreed upon in the laboratory, that this was one form of characteristic of this great out there? No. Because 
as we can experience the cosmic ray in the way that you've just described it, it's a function of our instruments and our own abstracting process. And it inevitably involves the transducing and all that it's stuff. Still theory, in other yeah, words. it's 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 not as direct as uh, you know. I've, I taught some time uh, some courses at the Naval Ordnance Lab, and I had one hell of a time talking with these hard-nosed applied scientists about this stuff, because they had gone through this in their scientific training. They still don't. Very little epistemology is taught. In, in scientific places that train scientists. They tend to be trained, in spite of Heisenberg, toward an expectation of certainty. Yeah. And they get... Sure. Uh, it's still not, let me, let me just follow that up with a, with a point. Well, hold just a second. I, I will get back to you in a moment. But I, there's a point that fits very well with here. Two days before the Three Mile Island incident in Pennsylvania, Fifty miles from where I live. <laughs> I was concerned. Two days before that happened, the president of the company that built those reactors said that anyone who talks about the possibility of an atomic disaster at this kind of installation is talking pure fantasy. We talk so glibly. See, you and I most of us, I guess, are, you know, uh, roughly middle-agey, let's say. Not most of us, but quite a few. And those of you who are less than middle-aged are even more caught up in this than some of us older folk. You have been hearing terms like atom and meson and all these supposed subatomic particles spoken of in an absolute way as though we're describing daisies and petunias. That it's very difficult, it seems to me, for you to back off from that and say, yeah, I've got to remember, all that is strictly inferred. We don't see that stuff. A strong inference, very strong, because of the predictability that it gives us. An atomic reactor is nonverbal, but it's built on the basis of formulations which are verbal. But it works. And when it works, we don't say that proves that our verbalization, our formulation, is absolutely correct. We say, hmm, not a bad formulation. We managed to process several hundred thousand Japanese. Not bad for a little old mathematical formula. We said before, see, this is just a model. This is not it. This is only a model. And we said it's okay for an artist to fall in love with his model. But it is not okay for a scientist to fall in love with his model. And that includes general semanticists or any kind of boulevard empiricist, uh, boulevard rather, um, epistemologists. If you fall in love with your model, you have by definition become non-scientific. If you fall in love with your model, you must defend it. And the gross contradiction of scientific method and the scientific attitude, at least as expressed in its best practitioners, I say best, and I suppose I derive that from Krzyzewski's attitudes, the model for that activity is to constantly question your model. And if you feel you've wrapped it up, say, well, that's it, I'm now on the big plateau. You're like, you're sort of at the position that 19th century physicists were before Becquerel and Rentkin and the Curies, where they felt that all they had to do, they had all the parameters laid out, and all they had to do was fill in the blanks. And that would be the job of physics for the rest of their lives and the lives of succeeding generations. Are we okay with the parabola? You ought to ask one more question, it seems to me. Why is that so sloppy up at the top? Yeah. Would well, Krzyzewski have a neurological disease as I have? I would say it goes on to infinity. Okay. If you're going to make a model to stand for infinite processes, you can't make an infinite model, can you? Because that would try to make the model 
identical with the thing you're modeling. There's another thing to keep in mind about that broken up off thing. That's the thumbprint of the model maker. That's Krzyzewski's signature, much more than this is. See, this is, he just wants to make his money. That's important. Didn't make enough. <laughs> As a person who works with the Institute, I know that very well. But to the extent that this could generate any income, got to have this structural differential by Alfred Krzyzewski, copyright, and all that good stuff. And we get lots of letters of the Institute, may I quote a picture, or may I refer to the structural differential, and all that nice stuff. Much more importantly, Krzyzewski's signature is at that jagged top. And she says, we're going to break the model off here. But I want you to realize that we're stopping the model, but what the model represents goes on indefinitely. All right? Crucial. Most models don't include that. Oh, many models include this. But they don't include the built-in awareness of the model maker of the limitations of his model. And that's why this is an open-ended model. The object, so-called level, let's again, I want to stress, understand that as the level at which we abstract non-verbally those things that we described before as the structurally determined selecting filtering, the transducing, the integrating, and projecting. And please note that up to this point, everything that we're talking about constitutes some kind of nonverbal process. The ongoing events, our own immediate neurobiological responses to those events, non-verbal. Language is not yet described as being involved in this process. Very, very important to recognize that because, of course, that means that whatever we talk about is always a summary statement. Whatever we talk about, whatever we may say, is, is the expression of activity neurobiological in character, which preceded our ability to speak. Follow genetically, but also individually. We all repeat that experience in our own development. You and I respond to some things that are going on. We internalize them in some way. We react to them. Some stimuli, boing, make a difference for us. We infer, however, that there are a lot more activities going on which would be potentially stimuli, but which we don't react to as far as we know. Cosmic radiation is one. There are some inferences that cosmic rays affect biochemistry and maybe a source of cancer. There are lots of speculations about that. But you and I, right now, being randomly bombarded by cosmic rays have no awareness of it. You are being also bombarded by photons of so-called light, and you are aware of that. As the king of Las Vegas said this morning, he, c <laughs> he can see light. But now he he's knows about discriminating about the possible uses of the term light. But he, he understands now that he can't see light as a physicist talks about it, but he has an experience with relation to light. We don't know what our experience with relation to cosmic radiation might be. So this, lots of stuff going on. We assume that what's represented by the parabola is subject to constant expansion as human knowledge progresses. That's the job of science primarily. Yes? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Too early. We're very neutral. We're trying to talk about the interaction between nervous systems and something going on. Pre-cultural. This is why general semantics can make the claim, 
of transcultural applications. I don't give a damn what culture you're talking about. At least this interaction describes the relationship between nervous systems and the environment of the nervous system. Sam Bois used to call what was represented by this as WIGO. And he, WIGO was an acronym for what is going on. I would like to suggest if you're going to write that down, you should change that to what we infer to be going on. Good old Sam occasionally used the years of identity even in published works. We don't know what is going on in a direct sense. But we infer and we cannot directly experience that. But it's a good formulation because we want to stress that a lot's happening, we can't directly experience it. All right. The object level, again, we're still not verbal. This is why I'm, I'm shunting off your cultural suggestions. We haven't evolved yet to culture. We're still pretty much at a protoplasmic level here. You were trying to get some feeling about... Now, I mentioned undifferentiated protoplasm this morning, and I didn't follow through on it because you were a lively group and somebody said something. We know that if we take a blob of protoplasm and stimulate it with an electrode, there will be a flow of electricity from where we made the stimulation to the edge of the protoplasm. And the first stimulation will be totally random. But if we do it again, we'll get another flow which perhaps somewhat approximates the first one but is different from it. But if we keep repeating that process, we will gradually achieve a, what's called canalization. And then the flow will become completely predictable. We will be able to say, if I stimulate the protoplasm here, I know that the flow will go in this particular pattern. And then it's no longer free. There you have a very simple model for the building up of cultures and for the building up of standard habitual semantic reactions and so forth. But we're not at that point yet. We're still just talking about what's the relationship between whatever's going on and nervous systems. We assume we cannot interview roaches. I don't know of anyone who's ever tried to do that. Okay? I know people that have tried to bug all kinds of situations, but I don't know anyone that's tried to bug a bug. I start with a, start a new desert bug a bug a bug a bug. But I infer when I turn on the kitchen light, and if there just happened to be a roach in the environment, and the roach scurries away from that light into his little hole somewhere, I infer that the roach projects and takes that light to be outside of itself. So to that extent, you and I behave in a way similar to the roaches. And up to this point, everything that we've said applies to nervous systems in general, no matter how simple or complex, and their interreactions with whatever happens to be going on. All right, now let's, if you're writing this down, let's put a little broken line here again to suggest that when we cross from here to here, we're making, from the evolutionary point of view, a tremendously large jump. We're making the jump primarily from the generalized animal level to the human level with the hedges that we talked about this morning related to the gorillas who can speak sign language, too, so far. This circle out here represents animal abstracting, what Kozhipsky used to call Fido. And he made the point that, yes, Fido abstracts, of course, he's a nervous system. He responds to stimuli. And he may even abstract at a few more levels. He may be able to have some sort of awareness of his first response, and the Pavlovian experimentation suggests that, that an animal can learn, a dog, for example, can learn to respond to the sound of a bell, which functions as a symbol for food, 
there's no food present, but the dog hears the bell and salivates. So he's just like you and me in that respect. He's responding to a symbol as if it were the thing. For the dog, the bell is the thing, and he salivates. Now, if I had a passage here, I could read you a passage from Bois in which he describes the cutting of a lemon. Very effective. And if I had it here, I'd read it. This is a little short paragraph. I went, my wife and I, we bought, I'm starting to salivate right now, and we bought some lemons. They were really juicy, succulent lemons. And it was a very hot day, and we were just, just yearning to have some of this lemony juice in our mouths. And I got home and I took out the lemon from the bag, and I put it on the board to cut it, and I took my knife and I cut through, and I could see the juice squirting from the interface between the knife and the surface of the lemon and all this stuff. How many are salivating? Quite a few. <laughs> you get some idea about identification? You get some idea about the word being responded to as if it were the thing? And you get some feeling for Pavlov's dog, who heard the bell and salivated. You heard the word lemon, some of you, and salivated. So we are different but similar. 